Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, also a free site. Today is September the 1st, 2020. Let's talk boxing, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now you have middleweight champion Jamal Charlo. He's unbeaten. And he's taking on a guy who, in my opinion, beat Triple G, right? The Revianchenko. Understand, the Revianchenko fights Danny Jacobs, his sparring partner in real life, right? He fights Danny Jacobs. Fight goes the distance and is razor close, right? The Revianchenko somehow sleepwalks through the early part of that fight, uh, finds himself getting beaten up then turns it around mid-fight, mid-fight, and is able to make it a close photo finish. He loses. But understand, Danny Jacobs, unlike most fighters, knew him. Well, he's fighting Triple G. Guess what? He comes out. He's getting beaten up. He gets dropped early in the fight. Dusts himself off and again, about a third of the way through the fight somehow writes the ship and then starts dominating the fight. I thought he won that fight clearly. I thought the decision to Triple G was a career appreciation award. We know Triple G lost that fight. At least that's what I'm going by. As I said, I trust two things in analyzing fights. My own two eyes. So, what I want people to do is to focus on unbeaten Jamal Charlo's loss. You heard me right, his loss. It's a great fight. It's one I revisited in preparing this video. It's his loss to Matt Karabov. Now, I've never seen an opponent do as well against Jamal Charlo as Karabov did. He was magnificent. But the secret to that fight is the fact that Korobov, who is masterful, I know he's had problems after that fight. I know he had problems with Andy Lee. I know in his career he's had problems. But he's a cagey vet, and he's masterful at slowing down the tempo of that fight. Right? He's a southpaw. He comes out. Folks, that's a low-volume fight. Let me say this. Charlo never figures out. And I mean never figures out. Karabov's straight left hand. His dominant hand. Karabov wisely hides it. He doesn't throw it enough for Charlo to figure it out. Right? Young fighters need to understand that it's not just about your volume. Sometimes it's about your lack of volume. Also, Karabov has a wide stance he knows how to use. He keeps Charlo, a guy who operates on rhythm, from getting close to him on a regular basis. So what you have is an exposed Jamal Charlo. Charlo can't handle the low volume. Charlo can't make the adjustments of Karabov straight left. But then you see something else in the fight. And it's clear as day. With his title on the line, understand, he wasn't supposed to be fighting Karabov. I don't care what fighters say in interviews right after a fight when they're asked whether they were tested I know you know Charlo knew late in that fight the 11th and 12th rounds that his unbeaten record and his title hung in the balance and Charlo who could not get in a rhythm didn't know how to fight a southpaw couldn't handle a straight left hand right couldn't handle low volume dug deep 
All you need to know about Charlo is that 12th round. With everything hanging in the balance, with what had to be the most frustrating 11 rounds of his life, he lands on Karabov. Now don't get me wrong. In my opinion, he still should have lost the fight. But he lands on Karabov. He clearly wins the 12th round. He has Karabov hurt. He tries to open up. Folks, this is 12 rounds into the fight. Right? Jamal Charlo is the kind of guy who you can beat him. You can frustrate him. For 70% of the fight, he's still going to keep coming. I don't believe they're paying you enough. The they being the casino to make a bet on this fight. My recommendation is that you grab your popcorn, you circle the date, you show up in front of the TV ready to watch an excellent fight. But that you keep your money in your pocket or in your safe or in your bank if you're someone who believes in the banking system. Right? This fight is simply too dangerous to touch. Both guys are dangerous. If I had a gun to my head, I'd probably lean a little bit to Jamal Charlo to win the fight. Let me say this, when I started looking at films on this, I was leaning toward Derevianchenko. But I saw enough to realize that whereas Karabov knew you have to take the air out of Charlo's tires. You have to slow this fight down. You have to keep him outside. You can't throw even your A-plus punch with any regularity. I'm not convinced that Derevianchenko, who's the opposite. He's a guy who wants to back you up. He's a guy who wants to throw punches. He's a guy who is uneven at the start of fights as well as in the middle of rounds. I'm not convinced that Derevianchenko has the discipline or has the fight style to deal with Jamal Charlo. So my recommendation is to be on the sidelines. It's not to make a bet. What I'm going to do the rest of this video is to just talk about my impressions of both fighters so you can decide for yourself. Understand, Charlo is younger. Charlo is the faster starter. Charlo is the fighter who needs to be in rhythm. But let me say this. There are other dynamics here that you need to know about. Right now, I'm not here to pretend that I've ever been a boxing trainer. I haven't been. I'm just a gambler. Some of the things I'm going to say here are controversial. Let them be controversial. It's what I'm thinking and I'm sharing it with you. This isn't a PC channel. Charlo is one of boxing's most exciting fighters. I'm surprised that he's not more popular. I believe one of the problems is that other than Austin Trout, who seems to find a way to lose all of his big fights, have you noticed that? Other than Austin Trout, Jamal Charlo really hasn't fought someone who the fans know, who the fans consider to be an elite fighter. Let me also say too that fans will punish you, fans will deliberately overlook you. When you have one of the sport's most glamorous belts, folks, the middleweight division is the belt Marvin Hagler had. Right? Old-timers would talk about divisions everyone understood. The middleweight division was, you know, Gene Fulmer's division. Right? We all understand. Uh, Bernard Hopkins, Carlos Monzon, so to have a guy at middleweight, as long as Charlo has been at middleweight, not fight 
the other great middleweights, right? Golovkin's a contemporary. Derevianchenko's fought Golovkin, not Charlo, right? Canelo was a middleweight. Canelo fought Golovkin multiple times. Charlo never fought Canelo, right? One of the problems I have with folks aligning themselves with very powerful people in boxing, I believe Charlo is with PBC, is that it's like the old studio system in Hollywood, right? The participants, the players, only play in the company shows. They don't branch out to take on other targets. Had Jamal Charlo wanted the pristine, exalted image in the sport, had he wanted to be considered with a Hagler, understand Hagler's out of the sport at 32, not much older than Charlo is right now. And Hagler, who had to travel to the United Kingdom to get his title. Right? Fought Hearns. Fought Duran. Fought Mugabe. Fought Hampshire. Fought Leonard. Then leaves at 32. Right? Charlo, by contrast, hasn't fought people like that. So let me say this. He is one of boxing's most exciting fighters. When you see him, there's something about him that connotes excitement. It's like looking at Manny Pacquiao, right? His whole persona, something's working there. Star power, call it what it is. But it's important because the judges sense the excitement. Judges love him, right? He's a hunter. He will find you. But the secret to Charlo, and it's a secret, right? Because he has a loud personality. His brother often is ringside at his fights and stuff like that. He, he takes time with the hair and stuff like that. It's a whole Broadway production. But his secret for the boxing purists out there is that he's a technician. He's at his best. This shows up in film after film when his opponent is backing away. In other words, he'll engage with the opponent, but when the opponent starts to move away from the pocket, Charlo is ready. He's accurate. He'll hover with the opponent, and as a guy thinks an exchange is over, and leans his head to back away, Charlo leans with him. He has punching power. When you first look at him, you think he's what I call a fastball pitcher. Right? That he's a guy who has a certain style, a certain energy that he's mastered. But he doesn't have other pitches. Right? Daniel Dubois for example. No, no, this guy's not a fastball pitcher, though. You'll actually notice watching him, he's a technician with a lot of tools and multiple strategies. He has an excellent jab. But you don't notice it that much because Charlo throws power punches. But there are times where he lives on that jab, and you notice the jab is stiff. Let me also say, too, his demeanor is a plus. In other words, you're watching him get undressed. That's the word. That's how I saw the fight, at least, by Matt Karaboff. But yet, Charlo has the kind of body language where you think, you know what? He's hiding the disappointment well, right? He always looks like he's winning the fight, right? Folks, that's important because, again, if a fighter looks frustrated in the ring, his opponent's going to know he's weakened. His opponent might have an incentive to up the ante even more. The judges are going to sense his disappointment. 
But what you notice is, as joyful, as calm, as Charlo looks, when the bullets start flying, and when the fight gets hectic, he is very calm. Right? He believes in his tools. He doesn't get caught up in the moment. He does not panic. Let me say this too. He has a skill that's underrated in the sport. He has a big right hand, but he can throw that right hand wide. He can throw that right hand straight. In other words, he can make adjustments. He couldn't adapt to Matt Karabov. But understand, Karabov is postgraduate school. Right? A guy who figures out, you know what, I'm not going to run in on Charlo. I'm only going to throw this straight left when I have to. I don't want him to be able to time it. Right? He couldn't make the adjustment on Karabov. But normally he makes adjustments. You'll notice it on his offense. Right? He does not panic. He can throw the right hand wide or straight. His left hook is also a money punch. This is the punch that he knows how to throw well when an opponent is backing away. He can lead. He can also counter. An excellent example of him throwing a spectacular counter is his stoppage of Julian Williams on a counter right hand. If you want to see a beautiful counter thrown by a guy who comes across as a fastball pitcher who's really a guy with a lot of tools in the shed, take a look at his stoppage of Julian Williams. So, let me say this. <clears throat> Charlo, and I know how fighters are, they say, what do you think of your opponent? And the fighter says, look, I'm just fighting whoever my manager tells me to fight. Right? The fighter says, hey man, I, I hardly watch film. I watched a couple rounds of him. I'm relying on my trainer. Right? I'm sure Charlo has the book on how to look like an overconfident uh, fighter and how to look macho and alpha. Right? Okay, fine. But I believe Charlo is going to see something in the film of Derevianchenko. First, Charlo can get out the gate quick. As I said, Derevianchenko's asleep at the wheel early in fights. Right? So I believe Charlo is going to figure out that if he comes out and blitzkriegs Derevianchenko, he'll have about six minutes of time before Derevianchenko can get his motor out of first gear. Now, Derevianchenko calls himself the technician. Understand, one of the problems Derevianchenko is going to have is that, like Charlo, he's a hunter. Right? Whereas Karabov was able to stand outside, use a wide base, right, with straight left hands to keep Charlo on his side of the ring. This fight's going to escalate quickly because Drevianchenko is going to come in and he's going to, after the first six minutes, he's going to try to trade with Charlo. He's going to try to pin Charlo on the ropes because understand he's pinned Danny Jacobs on the ropes. Understand he's pinned Triple G on the ropes. Understand, even though Drevianchenko doesn't have a lot of pro fights, he had a lot of amateur fights. His record is a little bit deceiving. Understand, too, <clears throat> he has a great trainer. He has Danny Jacobs' old trainer in his corner, right? That trainer broke up with Danny Jacobs, did not break up with Derevianchenko. Derevianchenko can fight low. That matters in this fight because Charlo's tall for 160, right? He's a short puncher. He has a high motor. He's high volume. The problem is he's not a hard puncher. I know he hurt Golovkin. 
especially with some body shots. People need to question Golovkin's ability after the Canelo fight and the Revianchenko fight to take body shots. But understand, he doesn't hit as hard as Charlo. He doesn't have Charlo's margin of error. He has the opposite problem of Charlo, right? Charlo's in the ring, you sense his charisma, you say, hey, this guy's a winner. Judges start to give Charlo rounds. Derevianchenko looks like he has an upset stomach. Right, looks like he just missed his bus. Right, his face doesn't exude excitement. That's the only way I can explain the judges' scorecards on the Golovkin fight, coupled with a bad start by Derevianchenko. Right? Same thing with Danny Jacobs, by the way. He knew Danny. Biggest fight of his career. He gets dropped early in that fight as well. Where I think this fight might turn, if you want to look at moments is the fact that Derevianchenko gets slow, but he missed the part of the fighting low memo, where a fighter who gets slow stays low. Right? You look at Joe Fraser, and he's low from the start of the round to the end of the round. Right? The only time he, you know, moves up, arguably, is when he's bobbing and weaving. Derevianchenko gets slow. Now understand, he's fighting a card player. He gets low. But then you'll notice that he gets distracted at times. So then he'll literally, after being low, even when he's having success, he'll lean backwards. A Jamal Charlo will wait for exactly that moment. He has the left hook to make moments like that matter. Understand, this is a guy who, as I said before, can change the trajectory of his punches. Right? I'm not going to touch this bet. They're not paying me enough. The they being the casino. To risk anything on this fight. There isn't a defined underdog here where you could structure a bet to say, okay, if this happens, I'm covered. If that happens, I'm covered. And if something else happens, well, the odds of that are so low that I'll risk it. You don't have that opportunity here. Charlo is a mild favorite, but both of them are going off around even money. Right, let me say this too. Derevianchenko's older. He's been in the ring arguably with better fighters than Charlo. Right, I know Danny Jacobs has, has faded a little bit. I know he lost to Canelo, but prime Danny Jacobs, I'd take him over Charlo. Prime Triple G, again, Triple G's older. Prime Triple G might be a few years ago. I'd take him over Charlo. Right? Extensive amateur pedigree. Derevianchenko has already been in big fights against great fighters. He's not going to be intimidated. Right? I believe two guys know who won that Golovkin fight. Him and Golovkin. So betting against Derevianchenko is a scary proposition. Right? This is a guy who never gets the decision in close fights. Right? He could have been awarded the decision in the Danny Jacobs fight. That decision, though, wasn't as egregious as the Triple G fight. Right? I thought Jacobs edged him. I thought Triple G beat him. Excuse me. I thought he beat Triple G by at least a couple of rounds. So this guy understands, given his age, this is his shot. Right? This is his shot. On the Charlo side of the aisle, I'm guessing he's looking around. And he's wondering why he's not more popular. He wants to make a statement. But, of course, 
just like when he fought Austin Trout, he's fighting a guy who somehow has found a way to lose the biggest fights of his career. Right Now, don't get me wrong. I thought Derevyachenko did enough to beat Golovkin. The bottom line is he didn't get the decision. Right? To Charlo's side of the aisle, Jamal, you're old enough to say to the powerful people around you, you know what, I need to make my name right now. Right? Give me Demetrius Andre. Have me do what Canelo did. Understand, Canelo, a guy who takes on challengers, leaves 160, thought it was a good idea to gain eight pounds, to fight Rocky Fielding, to pick up a title outside of middleweight, then came back to middleweight to fight tougher competition than the Revianchenko, excuse me, than Charlo has fought. Right? So I think this is a barn burner fight. I do see one situation where one fighter might be vulnerable. Right? Derevianchenko, as he leans back after being low, is open for some of what Charlo can throw. Charlo has ring coverage. The straight right could get there. That left hook is literally made for fighters who are low and then lean back because you're already in position to throw it if you're an orthodox fighter. I'm on the sidelines here. My suggestion is you be on the sidelines. This fight is a must see. I just don't believe the casino is paying you enough to take the risk here on either fighter. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.